and we ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they are re representing an organization or group and they may have five minutes in that case. Uh, appeal uh, decision from the Historic Zoning Commission pursuant to the provision of the section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via stat statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Um, first, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve last month's meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Last month's meeting minutes are approved. So now the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I understand we do have one. Um, yes, as the uh, slide shows, 2201 25th Avenue South has been removed from the consent agenda, and that's, Robin, that's going to be presented, it'll be presented uh, in the new business section. The remaining items on the consent agenda include 1701 Russell Street, which is new construction of an outbuilding, 303 North 16th Street, which is another outbuilding that requires a setback reduction. 1711 Linden is a new construction of an addition. 712 Fatherland Street is new construction for an addition. And 408 Broadway is an application for signage. Staff finds that all of these projects meet their respective design guidelines and recommends approval of the consent agenda. Okay. Melissa, uh, in the report that we received, uh, 303 North 16th Street was mm -hmm. on consent. Is that being presented today? or is it No, it, uh, it is still on consent. If you'd like it removed, it could be removed. But no, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you say it. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. First, any other questions to staff about the consent agenda? Okay. Well, let me make sure there's nobody um, this in the public that the any uh, on the consent agenda that um, need to be heard that you'd like to be taken off if in the public. Okay, a closed public hearing. Now I'll take your motion. All right, we need to uh, adopt the consent agenda with the one item uh, taken off, which is 2201 25th Avenue South. Okay, have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries, consent agenda carries. Uh, and we will start with 2201 25th Avenue. Oops. I had too much. For this one, you received an email from, uh, from someone from the public who was opposed to it, and you received that via email. 2201 25th Avenue South, located at the corner of 25th and Blair Boulevard, is a non-contributing building constructed in the mid-20th century. The applicant is requesting to add a 400-square-foot addition to the rear of the building which will back up to the side of a non-contributing building facing Blair. The area to the right of this red line shows where the addition will be. The existing house itself has a small massing compared to the historic context, and the addition will be even smaller, being approximately as wide as the existing house, but significantly shorter and only 12 feet deep. The addition is located at the rear of the property, the most appropriate location for additions. However, this will require a reduction of the rear setback that should be 20 feet and will only be 12 feet with this addition. The rear of the house will be approximately 24 feet from the house to its rear, which is oriented towards Blair, and this distance is in keeping with the development of the block, the historic development, which ranges between about 11 to 19 feet in between buildings. The setback meets, meets the MHCC's policy for setbacks because the distance between buildings is appropriate for the historic development. The lot is not as deep as the majority of lots, and the neighborhood, and, and there's no rear alley. The need for setback reductions on corner lots is fairly common because these lots are typically at least half as deep as the normal lot. For example, this uh, lot in Park in Elkins, lot one at the top has a minimal rear setback that was approved by the commission this year. 
This infill at the corner of Chapel and Benjamin was allowed a 10-foot rear setback because of the shallowness of the corner lot. This is a similar um, example in Hillsborough, Hillsborough West End where a rear setback reduction will probably be needed if someone ever removes these non-contributing buildings. These are two lots at the corner of Barton and 24th. Because the lots are so shallow, that rear setback reduction will be needed. There are not a great number of situations like this in the Hillsborough West End area, but there are a few. There are many historic examples throughout all of our historic districts. This area at the corner of Belmont and Blair, for instance, again, there's a large four square, is the yellow lot at the top, and it has an 18-foot rear setback. The apartment building below only has a five-foot rear setback. If the addition is not located at the back of the building, which is really the only possible place, it would have to be located on the front of the building or to the right side of the building, which would create inappropriate setbacks for 25th or for Blair. Staff recommends approval of the addition and the rear setback reduction with the conditions that staff review vi final details of windows and doors and that the HVAC be located towards the rear of the property if a new location is necessary. Staff finds the project to meet the requirements for new construction in the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay and the MHCC's policy for setback reductions. The applicant is here. He doesn't have any additional information for you at this time, um, but he's here if you have any questions for him. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Robin? Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, before I open public hearing, I'd like to uh, invite the council person to please uh, come speak first on behalf of this project, uh, on regarding this project. Thank you very much. I'm Berkeley Allen. Uh, I live at 3521 Byron Avenue. I'm council member for the 18th district. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak on this issue. I've heard from um, several neighbors that have concerns about the allowance of the rear setback um, because of the, the current allowance is 20 feet and to reduce that to uh, close to 10 uh, does not seem a consistent with There you go. Does not seem consistent with what we see in the rest of the neighborhood. We do see 10 feet between houses very frequently um, from side to side, but uh, generally it's not the rear of the house as, as frequently. Um, I do understand that, uh, that historic can give variances for setback um, and that corner lots do get special treatment, um, as Robin has explained. Um, it does seem uh, to me, though, that because this is a non-contributing lot that um, it's hard for me to understand why it gets treatment for that you're giving to historic properties uh, to make them to be consistent with what is historic. Um, furthermore, I was not contacted by the owner of this property asking for our support for the setback. I've only heard from neighbors who are concerned. Um, it is important to us to know that the, the conservation zoning overlay protects the historic character of the neighborhood. Um, and there is the question of if this is being applied to non-contributing homes in a way that simply gives them more square footage without adding to their historic character, how does that protect the historic character of the neighborhood? Um, so I would, um, I would ask that you look at this very carefully, that you take the concerns of the neighbors into account, um, and either if you think there might be some way we could work this out, I would ask for a deferral, or if, um, if this seems to be what the owner needs to do, then I would, I would request in this case that you not support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'd like to um, open public hearing. Um, others that would like to speak uh, regarding this project, please um, come forward and say your name and your address. Could, Mr. Chairman, could I, could I ask staff uh, if they could change the slide to reflect the actual property? Sorry, this is one of the examples, and it was confusing me. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That's good. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Mims, and I've lived at 2410 Blair Boulevard since 2005, and I've lived in Nashville since 1981. After moving to the Hillsborough West End neighborhood, I served as CZO block captain on Blair Boulevard. I polled residents and property owners up and down Blair and ultimately received an overwhelming consensus among my neighbors for support of the CZO, which is now in place. 
Then, back in 2010, when I built an addition to my own home after the flood, I had to go through the MNHC application process. My plan A was not acceptable, so I submitted a plan B. I understand the process, and I complied with the existing CZO requirements to make the changes I wanted to make to my home. The new owner of the duplex at 25th and Blair was aware when he purchased it that summer that his property was guided by a CZO. Now he is asking for a variance to the setback restriction which has been in place for years. He proposes to add approximately 400 square feet to the already existing 1,000 square feet of this non-contributing structure. Since 1996, this commission has been tasked with an important job to preserve, protect, and document the history, historic places, buildings, and neighborhoods of Davidson County. I oppose the issuance of this variance, and I respectfully ask this commission to consider how its approval will help you to continue to be good stewards of one of Nashville's few remaining historic neighborhoods. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Formosa. I'm a high school teacher here in town, and I live at 2503 Blair Boulevard, directly next door to the property in question. I am opposed to the changes. Um, I have been, I've lived in Nashville all my life, and one of the reasons I was attracted to this neighborhood was because of its historic nature. So I think maintaining that is very important, and I think that those rules are in place for a reason. I believe that accepting these changes would set a poor precedent for the neighborhood. Um, additionally, because I am directly adjacent to this home, the addition would affect the privacy of my home, and allowing those changes would directly infringe upon the privacy of my home. So I am opposed, and I wanted to express that viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suzanne Elmer. I live at Blakemore, uh, 3003 Blakemore Avenue. Um, I'm a Hillsborough West End resident for the last 15 years. I'm a Hillsborough West End board member, and I also am a licensed professional realtor uh, in this area. Um, Hillsborough West, uh, West End neighbors <clears throat> went through the proper process of canvassing for support, developing guidelines, and getting the proper approvals to adopt the current conservation zoning overlay. Hillsborough is currently going through the process again to even further expand the CZO to include even more of our neighborhood. <clears throat> the adopted guidelines are ample to allow and encourage new development and renovations within the guidelines that achieve the preservation of our historic neighborhood. The request setback variance <clears throat> from a 20-foot setback of the current rear to a 12-foot proposed setback is significant, particularly as a precedent-setting issue for future variance requests. Their current property owner purchased the home uh, on August 16th of this year with the Hillsborough West End conser Conservation Zoning Overlay in effect. If the addition was needed by the current property owner, his offer to purchase the property should have been contingent upon him being able to make the desired changes to the property. Uh, the owner of any property should be permitted and encouraged to improve their property, but to do so within the underlying zoning and Hillsborough West End conservation zoning overlay guidelines. This is the agreement in wh into which conscientious home buyers enter when acquiring a home within a conservation zoning overlay. Hillsborough <clears throat> West End neighbors worked very hard to develop and adopt these uh, guidelines. The overlay is intended to protect the integrity and design of the neighborhood against piecemeal exceptions such as this. It's in Hillsborough West End, excuse me, Hillsborough West End's best interest to have property owners make improvements to their property within the guidelines adopted and approved by the neighbors and Metro Council within the conservation zoning overlay. I'm respectfully requesting that the Metro Historic Zoning staff and commissioners deny the request for the setback variance. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Sherritt Newman. I live at 2700 Westwood Avenue in the Hillsborough West End neighborhood. I'm also a member of the board of the Hillsborough West End Neighbors. Although I've only lived in Nashville for the past three years, much as yourselves in my previous community, I served on the Landmarks Preservation Board, so I know what you're dealing with here. I have also brought letters from two other neighbors who wanted to have their points of view considered. As a neighbor who walks by this property daily, drives by it frequently, um, I know that the owner is a new owner and he bought knowing if he had done his due diligence with the conservation overlay in place. I am very concerned that if we allow this variance that we will erode what our conservation overlay means. I bought in this neighborhood because it is a historic neighborhood and that it was being preserved. I think we are setting a dangerous precedence by chipping away at our overlay, which we are working very hard to expand to encompass more of our neighborhood. And that is all I have to offer to you. And I thank you for your time. And I hope you consider this very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Campany, and I live at 20, uh, 2507 Blair Boulevard, just two doors west of this property on the same side of Blair. Uh, I have no new arguments to offer, but I'm just here in support of the ones you've heard, essentially. My main concern is that we have an overlay, which apparently, uh, before I moved here three and a half years ago, was fought for very hard and worked for very hard. And we, uh, if you approve this request, you risk um, weakening something that was very difficult to put in place in the first place. My house, I would just add, is 100 years old, and one of the things, as we just heard, one of the reasons that I was interested in purchasing a home in this neighborhood was its historic character. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? I, I would like to um, ask if the owner would like to uh, just open that up to him one more time. If the owner would like to say anything uh, before we close, not pressuring you. You don't have to, but I, if you'd like to, you're welcome to. Yeah, my name is Tong Wang. I'm the property owner of 220 25th Avenue. Yeah, I think this property is located at the corner of 25th Avenue and Blair Avenue. And uh, these uh, two streets are very busy, especially for the Blair Avenue. And I just want to have a playroom for the kid because this property uh, is no backyard and both of the outside is faced to the road. So there is no space to play for the kid. It's no safety. So I just uh, only want to get a safety playroom for the kid. This is why I want to put additional at the back. That's all I want to see. Yeah. Okay. Um. And while he's here, uh, just ask the uh, board members, which is any question you'd have of the owner? Okay. I do have Thank a question. You. Oh, go ahead. I do have a question. So is this building a duplex? Yes, ma'am. So the, the construction that you're putting in the back will include both duplex? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Nothing else. I'll close public hearing and um, get offer discussion. Robin, can you um, refresh my memory on your presentation? Are there cases in this um, Hillsboro West neighborhood where the rear yard step back has been amended or had a variance on like this one before? I didn't go back through cases, so I'm not sure if there's been one in this neighborhood. I know that you have done it all over all of our districts. Because those corner lots aren't the same size, 
typically as a regular lot, they're not nearly as deep, and so it's very difficult to do much on them without some sort of setback reduction. I do want to clarify this isn't a variance that's being asked for. It is a reduction to the setbacks which, you have, which the ordinance gives you the ability to set. And the, we heard an argument that um, we're applying overlay standards uh, to a non-compliance compliant house could you or structure sure. could you comment on that That's a good question yes um, you have not looked at the setback reductions in terms of whether or not the individual building was historic or not the whole reason for the setback reduction ability is so that you can allow for development that makes sense for the neighborhood overall so it's not about it's not something extra historic building gets. It's something that you can allow so that development happens appropriately. And our research showed that there is even much less space between buildings than what's being requested here. Is there, we're, our purview is not to question what the structure is going to be used for? It is not. We do, do not review use. It is already a duplex. Further discussion? Go ahead. Robin, um, just want, I think, maybe based on the, some of the public comments to clarify for the commission and for the public, the setbacks are established by the base zoning, is that correct? Not by the historic overlay. Is that correct? Well, the way the ordinance reads, you have the ability to set the setbacks. Correct. But now, as a policy, we have always just gone with the code requirements because they make good sense and they work in most cases. But they don't work in all cases, which is the reason you have that additional ordinance that allows you to change them. Like this 20-foot setback, where, where did that come from? That came from code. Okay. So. But for a corner lot... You know, it gets a lot trickier to say what's truly the rear, and you know, from a code perspective, the rear is really the side for Blair. Um, so again, that's why you have that ability to to look at what's appropriate for the de historic development of the neighborhood. So I think that the reason I asked that is um, it was I think it was suggested by some of the public comments that um, the reduction of the setback is in violation of the. Um, of the uh, the ordinance itself, the historic zoning ordinance, and so it's important for us to understand that those setbacks are set based on the base zoning district, which may apply in historic districts as well as non-historic districts, and so that's why we're given the authority to allow other setbacks if they're consistent with the guidelines and with with the neighborhood. Is that correct? That's correct. Which probably helps at least helps me understand why staff's recommending uh, approval of this. Did you have something or if not? Okay. Um, so are we ready for a motion? Okay, then move one. See the slide. Back a couple. Oh, that one right there. On this one, you see the side of the house that faces Blair and the, the back of the house, and then you see the house right behind it that's facing Blair. So where you kind of see a little bit of gravel right behind the house, that's where that addition will be. Okay, any more discussion? I, um, somebody there. I just wanted to ask um, ask one other thing. So the staff doesn't have any objections to, well, let me ask this first. For non-contributing structures, additions to uh, non-contributing structures still have to um, comply with the guidelines, correct? That's correct. And so 
so the addition, the staff feels like the addition is appropriate. That's correct. It's very minimal. It's nowhere near as tall as the house, which is already very short. It's no wider than the house. Mm -hmm. It's a very small house to begin with. Mm -hmm. Each unit is, I think, a little over 600 square feet. Okay. So, um, you know, compared to what you usually see, this is yeah. very, very modest. You know, I'm having trouble myself getting... I can understand the community's concerns, the neighborhood's concerns, um, but if, if this was a, which I think there are examples like this in this neighborhood as well as others, if this were a contributing structure, um, sitting on an abnormally small lot, um, and um, they did a rear addition, wasn't visible from the street, met the design guidelines, um, that was approximately 10 feet from from the property line, uh, it, we would be faced with the exact same question we're faced with today. So I think it, we need to be a little careful not to let this sort of non-contributing sort of um, you know yeah and non-contributing addition really um, affect you know the decision on the setback question. It's easy to look at a, a, you know something like this and, and think, well, you know, I might not like the way it looks, but if it meets the guidelines and if it's consistent with the community in terms of set other rear setbacks, and um, I think that's what we're really asked to, to look at today. Um, so I'm having, I'm ha you know, while I understand the community's concerns, I also understand the staff's recommendation. Um, you know, because of those things that I've mentioned. Are you ready for a motion? Um, you need to tell us kind of yeah, I'm, I'd program. actually close public hearing. I'm sorry. Um, unless staff, unless the commission would like to open it back up, I don't mind. Okay, just this once, we'll, I'll do it. If you want to have one last thing to say. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Please come to the, the mic and say your name and address. My name is uh, Benoit de Wont. I live in 2408 Blair Boulevard, so I'm just really facing this, uh, uh, this uh, house. Uh, no, that has been discussed here. It's a, a non-contributing uh, building in the, uh, in the neighborhood. And my concern really is that uh, allowing this would transform a relatively small, non-contributing building to something that's bigger. Uh, I don't think it adds much to the uh, to the value of the neighborhood, and uh, uh, I would I would ask you to consider not to uh, not to grant it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Close public hearing. For real. <laughs> okay. Um, comment. Any more comments? Yeah. Comment. More discussion. Um, in other projects that we have heard where the council person representing the conservation overlay and neighborhood, when there is opposition, that there would be conversation between the applicant and the um, neighborhood association. So from what I think I'm having a little hard time with having so much opposition and no conversation between the two parties to possibly have an amicable resolution. I mean, whether does that sound reasonable? I um I understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, the um, but that is that's not our. We can't view. make that. I mean, recommend. You know, that's that's a great. I it would it would have been good if that had happened, but we just have to. Um, Decide on the case that's before us, okay. based on everybody that said, of course. But unless the applicant requests, yeah. Yeah. unless the yeah. unless the applicant requests a deferral mm -hmm. to meet with the neighbors, um, but that's something we can't do. So it's up okay. to. And, and also, just to clarify, that we did hear from staff that in this neighborhood conservation overlay, there there has been setbacks in other projects. So this is not an unusual case. Is that correct? 
It is definitely not unusual to allow a setback reduction in this type of scenario. The good news is there aren't a lot of these types of scenarios. It's usually only corner lots that really have this kind of situation where the back of a house backs up to a side of a house, and it has to be a corner lot that was subdivided at some point so that the lots are unusually small, and there are just not a whole lot of those scenarios in the neighborhood. In, so, in, in this particular neighborhood, or Hillsborough West End? Hillsborough West End, that's right. So I don't know that this would necessarily um, set any kind of dangerous precedent, you know, based on what the research that we've done. Okay. Thank you. One, Robin, one more thing. So it, is it safe to say that the, uh, the staff's over, the driving force behind staff's recommendation is the odd size of this lot? It's it's the odd size of it, the location of it being on the corner, mm -hmm. and that the new spacing between the buildings will more than adequately meet the type of development that you see throughout the neighborhood. Thank you. The, it's it's not pushing too close to the building behind it. The spacing between it will still be more than the normal spacing that you see between buildings. And historically, based on those last two examples I showed, when you have these corner lots that are an unusual size, historically they didn't meet a 20-foot setback. Okay. Are you guys ready for a motion? I'll uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, again, while, while I can appreciate some of the concerns, I think um, given the staff's um, findings and recommendations, um, I'll move we approve staff recommendation. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Okay. No. Okay. So that. Um, do you mind doing your hands real quick for me on the uh, on the nose? Okay, two nos. Okay, so I think that's four yeses and two nos. So uh, motion carries. Okay, on to new business. Um, Eleven one eleven Fourth Avenue South. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Tucker Herndon on behalf of so, uh, I'm first and then uh, oh, we'll open it up for public comment after that. Uh, getting ahead of the game here. Uh, <laughs> but while the people are uh, filtering out here from the last case, I'll remind the commissioners, uh, most of you are pretty good about it, but to press the speak button so your microphone lights up when, when, you're, uh, when you're speaking, just so that it's all recorded on the public what? record. <laughs> all right, here we go. Okay, so here we go, uh, 111 4th Avenue South. Uh, some records, I think, show it as 105 5th Avenue South, but it's certainly this building here that we're talking about. It's a Victorian-era commercial building. It was constructed before 1897. The building is two stories tall with a traditional storefront on the lower story, and the upper story features some uh, eclectic architectural elements, including a large double-hung window, with uh, beaded molding around it, and it's flanked by two arched top windows. There's also or terracotta or ornamental brickwork on the cornices, and the uh, decorative molding on the front facade of the building as well. The side facades feature segmental arched windows. The win windows themselves uh, are likely replacements, but the window openings are original. Uh, the Fourth, uh, the avenue, the front storefront was uh, rehabilitated in 1987, and then again recently, uh, but with the introduction of operable windows. Uh, but overall, the general appearance is still uh, very similar to the original appearance. The application today is seeking approval to remove the upper story windows on the front and sides and to replace them with roll-up sectional doors and to construct projecting balconies on both uh, both sides and the front of the building. Uh, you can see 
photographs above and then uh, the architect's mock-up of what the what is proposed below. In your packets, you also have the actual elevation drawings. Uh, as you know, the design guidelines state that historic window openings and original wall surfaces should be retained and that window openings not original to the building should not be introduced. And the guidelines also state that balconies should not be added to public facades. Staff finds that the original wall planes and window openings, as, long, as well as the architectural features that I described on the front, to be significant to the styles, materials, and methods of construction from the late 19th century. And for this reason, staff finds that the proposed work would have an adverse effect on the historic character of the building and of on the district overall, and that it would not be meet design guidelines 2H1, H5, 2I1, nor would it meet the Secretary of Interior standards for treatment of historic properties. Uh, the addition of balconies, as I said, is also specifically prohibited under guideline 212 and by guideline 3H3, as they would damage or obscure historic architectural features and drastically alter the appearance of the building. Uh, additionally, uh, the proposed work would likely result in the building no longer being eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And for that reason, and those described before, staff recommends disapproval of the application, finding it does not meet the design guidelines for the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, any questions, Sean? Sean, while you're there, uh, there's another building that has balconies on, on the same facility. Could you discuss that? Uh, yes, that is, um, I think, 329 Broadway. I think I might be, I think I got that address right. That's uh, that's a non-contributing building. Uh, when I moved here, it was Shawnakee. I think everybody still kind of thinks of it as Shawnakee. But even that, there were things before it where it had been modified from its original appearance, probably also originally dates to the late Victorian era. But by the 50s and 60s, the front facade had been removed. The windows had been removed. The the corner was cut, um, really d drastically changed the appearance. So that's not a contributing building. This, however, is still a contributing b building with much of its historic character intact. So a non-contributing building has more leeway than a contributing building and things they can do or can't do? Or is that just something that was done before these things were in place? Or Both. Uh, there are, you can make changes to a historic, to a non-contributing building that you could not do to a historic building. But overall, balconies are not typical of the character of Broadway. Um, that particular one, um, I'm not sure of the I'm not sure of the particulars. I should say, um, I'm not, obviously I've seen the building, but I wasn't involved in in the review, so I'm not sure what discussions went on. But there, again, there was an existing building that could have been demolished. There are existing conditions, perhaps openings and floor levels and pilasters that they were working with. I shouldn't digress too much. I, I guess, but but no. to length the two is inappropriate. Correct. Sean, I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, well, one question regarding both the front and side windows on the upper levels. Did you say um, whether those are are original or you believe they're original? Uh, I think the windows themselves are not original. Um, I've actually never I've been inside the building, so I, I haven't been in to check. Um, and obviously, they're on the second story, so I can't really see from the street. The openings themselves. That's really what I'm asking. Right yeah, there. the openings, the arched window tops. Um, well, uh, maybe you can actually see in these pictures. Yeah, they, they, they have arched window tops uh, with like a row lock arch, segmental arch. Um, that's definitely historic. The, win the actual window glass has probably been a real replaced over time. So this building didn't necessarily have a second story building built right up to it like many buildings in the district. No. Um, it, uh, I look back through the Sanborns, it, uh, it one time was a shoe store. Um, it had some sort of, not a warehouse, but it just said store. But I know at one time it was a shoe seller. Perhaps they even made shoes there. Uh, but it always did appear to be a freestanding building. And then my last question is, um, um, has slipped my mind now. Um, 
Sorry, I'll come back to it, I'm sure. Any Thanks. other questions for Sean? Well, see how bad my memory is. <laughs> okay. If you think of it, you can ask him yeah. again. All right. Thanks, Sean. Um, okay. With the owner uh, or applicant, I'm sorry, would they like to come forward and speak as well? Good afternoon, members of the commission. Tucker Herndon on behalf of Swinging Door Saloon LLC, the owner of the business and the building itself. As Mr. Alexander has explained, the building was built in 1897, and through significant alterations, the, the building has, has changed its life to a shoe store and multiple other businesses. But in 2010, my client bought the building that was in significant need of a rehab. At that time, my client spent quite a bit of money trying to continue with the historical character and integrity of the building, but yet improve the property for the downtown overlay. Uh, all of the developments that have been surrounding the property have either been, like what Mr. Alexander said, non-conforming or have been able to do the exact same thing that we have wanted to do through some exigent circumstances. The over, I mean, the drawings that we have, we don't want to quite go as far as the depiction shows with the balcony. What we would like to do is we would like to try to stay consistent with what has been accepted in the downtown overlay, whereby we put railings and create an open area environment upstairs. And I've got some pictures. If we can pass them around. We're not trying to change the stru structural integri integrity or by any means remove the property from the historic zoning register. We're trying to improve the property to create business for downtown while in turn keeping the historic integrity of the building. We believe that the historic value of the property is significant and all we're trying to do is replace and change the windows that are in the building. Currently the upstairs is dark. We would like to create an open air environment. We believe that the change would not affect anything other than small areas of brick on the outside. By putting the metal area that we have in the pictures, it will allow patrons to have an open air environment and there can be interaction from people inside and outside if it be you know, parades, if it be sporting events, and this is located very close to the Bridgestone Arena and the areas that they close for all of the parades and whenever they have CMA Music Fest. So we believe that it is very beneficial for the business and for downtown, the tourism, to increase the foot traffic. So we would request that we have the ability to make minor improvements to the building without affecting the historical integrity. Yeah, we, we would not go so far as to put a balcony that is that extreme. We're trying to do more of what the picture shows. Questions? Um, I'm not I have, really sure I understand what you're proposing to do. What we would like to do is we would like to take the current windows and bring them up a foot or two and down a foot or two and create that railing and having the exact same thing that we were allowed in 2011 to do where we had these slider windows that could open as opposed to a typical window that opens vertical. We would like to have a window that is horizontal that fo folds on top of itself to create a more open air environment. I, and also I want to make sure so you, you are not, you are also modifying the window openings here too. You're still saying to modify the window openings from the rhythm that is already there to the um, basically two big openings as shown in your rendering. I, just I just think you, for clarification. I think if you take the current drawing that should be in the packet, I believe, it shows four windows that two of them have an oval on the top and then two of them are actually rectangle windows. We would like to take the two smaller ones and make them the size of the two rectangle windows to create more of an open air environment. That way that we can put those on sliders and open them up to the general public. Very similar to what we did downstairs with the slider windows. I would say, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I would suggest that you consider deferring what you've got in front of us and submitting a new plan to staff because now we're dealing with a different design and I think we're most concerned about is does it jeopardize 
the historic significance of the property and, and would it push it off the register? And that's our biggest concern. So, and we need to get staff to tell us if that's if that will happen or not. Uh, it because altering the openings, I believe, would um, actually gets to that point. Altering openings at all. Well, I think what Richard is saying is, is the application is not what he's asking us to to to, uh, to vote on today. But what we would have to do is vote on what you have presented to us today. Not not the picture that you pick up, thrown on but it's sit around. Well, but, but this is what we have to consider. I think you might. Understand. With, with the commission's approval, we will be happy to defer, get some renderings that are more applicable to what we are asking for. Okay. And just, yeah, and definitely work with staff on it, too. Okay. So we are going to... Um, I don't think I have to vote on a deferral, right? Yeah. Okay. So at this time, per the applicants, we'll uh, close this case because the applicant would like to defer it, this motion. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Okay. Next is 1314 Lillian Street. Oh, I'm sorry. Lillian. 1305 Lillian Street. So this is an application to construct a new single family structure on a vacant lot in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The lots on this block of Lillian Street are actually pretty steep. Many of them were never developed or were developed late, much later than the rest of the neighborhood. And as such, most of the surrounding context here is non-contributing. Uh, these are a few examples that have been approved in the last few years by the commission and obviously have been constructed. The new house at 1305 will be one and a half stories with architectural features of the Tudor revival style, including an arched vestibule at the front entrance, a steeply pitched front gable, some ornamental brick patterns, and the house will have a side gabled roof with a ridge height of 26 feet above finished floor level. The floor level is higher towards the front because the grade drops down towards the street. The elevations show a foundation height of seven feet at the front, whereas the similar situated houses recently constructed uh, have a foundation shorter than that, it appears to be around five feet. In order to keep the perceived height of the new building compatible with the surrounding context, staff believes that the foundation height foundation height should match those nearby houses, and also that there should be a different material for the foundation to indicate the floor level. Um, typically, you have uh, the expression of the foundation and floor level differentiated by different materials, historically a stone foundation, brick house, or something like that. Um, see in the site plan, uh, there's a front parking area. The steep grade prevents the ability to add a driveway uh, to access park, and there is no alley, so there would be no parking at the rear. Uh, the parking pad is pushed back to allow for a future sidewalk, which is appropriate, uh, and that and the side setbacks, front setbacks, are also appropriate and consistent with the context. The, uh, the two houses that are to the left, I think it would be these two, a vacant lot, and then the new structure uh, would be to the right of that. These two recently constructed structures, you'll see 1209 has a split face block foundation, obscured somewhat by landscaping, um, but 121211 to the right of that has brick to grade, uh, has brick to grade. Uh, it was approved with parge concrete foundation. Looks like it wasn't built that way. Um, and it's an example of uh, obviously what is intended for the new structure by the applicant. Seeing these two side by side, staff feels it is an illustration of how brick to grade exaggerates the perceived wall height. And for that reason, staff finds that a different material for the foundation would be more appropriate. Other dimensions of the structure, the depth, the width in the lot, um, are appropriate as are the fit, the pitch and form of the roof, the window proportions and window rhythm are also appropriate. The materials will be 
uh, brick, as I said, wood and cement fiber for the upper story and trim, uh, composite shingle wood, uh, composite shingle roof and wood windows. Um, the stairs uh, are not, the material's not indicated. Um, and again, staff finds that the brick uh, to grade should be re replaced for a, uh, a concrete block or some other appropriate material for the foundation. Um, oh, that's the last one for that. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application to construct a new house at 1305 Lillian Street with the conditions that the material of the foundation be changed to express the level of the finished floor, um, that the foundation height and grade at the front uh, match the recently constructed houses on the side of the street, and that staff have final approval of the brick, windows, and door selections, and the material of the front stairs and walkways. Meeting those conditions, staff finds that this proposal would meet the design guidelines for the Lachlan Springs overlay. Thank you, Sean. Questions? Sean, I assume that staff have final approval of the stairs includes uh, handrails and balusters. I know mm -hmm. the drawings don't show, but I, I believe applicant would have to confirm with codes, but I believe that, that would be required with yeah, the Yeah, I believe that'll stair. be necessary. Thank you. Uh, yes. Sean, on the side elevations, what you're suggesting is the foundation would, you would see that for What's that? Six or eight feet or so at the at the back there. I mean, the whole bottom, more or less where that dashed line is. That dashed line is the floor level, but typically that is also where a material change happens on the exterior of a building. Any more questions? Okay. Um, Sean, on the. Uh, right up here, number six on orientation. Um, generally, curb cuts should not be added. And, you know, of course, the neighborhood has, uh, you know, curb cuts. And it, this is in italics, where, where a new driveway is appropriate, it should have two concrete strips with a central grassy medium. So when that happens, and I guess it's just a general comment, um, in applications that come to you all, is that a suggestion to the applicant? Um, sure. That is usually for a driveway, and this is a parking pad, mm -hmm. which normally you would not see, we would not want to have in the front of a building. But because of the grade of the lot, there's nowhere to have a usable driveway. There's no way to get parking in the back because the grade rises so much. So they're having to create a condition that's not typical for you, typical for what you usually see. And so that's why it's not strips, because it's a wide parking pad instead of a driveway, if that makes sense. And is that in guidelines? The, the parking strips? The, yes. Yes, it's in the guidelines okay. as italicized information. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, would the applicant like to come forward and say, speak on I'm Jamie Pfeffer. I'm the architect on this project, uh, address 521 8th Avenue South, Suite 103. Um, and I think uh, we're in agreement. I was hoping to have a little conversation on, on the brick and some of the subjectivity to it. And, you know, it's... Um, it's difficult because there's, you know, we don't want to, I don't want to establish a, a precedent later that will cause issue, but this lot, everything about this lot is such that it's it's very unusual and there's a reason it was not developed in the original um, development of this neighborhood and everything else because of the slope and because of um, those details. And typically, you know, we, we had a hard time tracking down precedents where you have a, a back to front slope where you're going to expose more foundation on the front as opposed to the back. You know, we, we see many times the reverse of this where the house comes in off of grade on the street and you know, slopes down and you have the walkout basement or things like that and we see the expression of the uh, of the floor and of the block and so the question I want to pose is is about you know are there ways of my concern with changing the materials is that we're gonna we're gonna really by exposing so much we're gonna really change the proportion of the house and sort of the overall effect of the house and you know what what happened on um, and I did bring a photo just in case on 
1209. I was not a part of that. Um, I was not a part of the project at, at 1211 um, where they where they did not where they kept the brick as opposed to doing a, a parched concrete or something like that. Um, I was a part of the 1209 project and there and I'm not you know I'm not really sure of the development but what what they what happened there was they they brought the masonry course down below the floor level and you, you'll see in the drawing or in the photograph you'll see the foundation vent is is sort of you know, foundation vent is in the masonry, so they they really you know there's kind of a that even was not really an ideal situation either, um, and and I think my my concern is as we start looking at the side elevation, as we start looking at the examples of of things of how do you find you know there aren't many examples of where you have something where you have a sloped a sloped lot condition, especially one where it expresses itself with more slope on the front, and uh, and trying to find an example where we can look for it. I think that. You know, my question would be: Is there a way we can, you know, do a, a row lock course or do some other things with the masonry, express the water table in another way? But I'm worried the change of the change of material will kind of exaggerate the proportion of of that grade. And I think you know the intent would be to follow the grade of the neighboring lots and to kind of create a similar condition. But I think the you know the goal I think would be to try to you know again find that right balance of proportion and detailing such that we don't overexpress the foundation. I, I worry that a five or six feet of exposed foundation block will will exaggerate the um, will exaggerate the, the the unusual and really um, difficult topographic condition. So you're basically, can you give a, just a guesstimate about um, how that height is going to be? Because I'm assuming then that you're saying that, I know we're not looking at it, but um, that you're, I'm assuming that you're saying that because of it, it's going to get where it's going to change the proportion. So do you have a guesstimate on how much it will be shown? Well, I think what, I mean, where the dotted line is shown in the drawings is the foundation line. And if we were to, you know, listening to the, um, the ordinance, oh, okay. that, that dashed line would be the point on the block. Unfortunately, that depiction, um, that front elevation, you know, what happens on the side elevation, you can see that disparity between the, the grade line and the side elevation. Um, the front elevation really needs to properly depict that, and I apologize that we've um, not shown that disparity there, but what, what happens is the distance between the dashed line and the grade line would be the amount of exposed block on the front of the house. And you can see on the 1209 Lillian Street, you know, they, they kind of did that little, they, they did, they, they brought the brick down even below that line to minimize the number of coursings of block that were, are visible. And my concern would be, you know, we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll have the, every bit of uh, at least five feet of of, of foundation block showing. So we're going to be talking about, you know, we're going to be talking about seeing eight coursings of block showing on the front elevation. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I think it's hard to make the judgment call because I, I don't disagree with the applicant um, in that it it's probably going to look a little funny to have almost as much uh, foundation as you have brick above, though it's hard to tell since the elevation isn't complete. So, and is there would there be a way for me to continue the dialogue where we depict that uh, with staff or in another Absolutely. form where we can find? I mean, again, we want to find uh, an appropriate solution, and I, I just worry that. Putting putting block, you know, eight courses of exposed block is something that none, none of us would ultimately be be sad. I think there's another another solution yeah. that might be best for all. I agree. I think, um, I think that depend, depends on the motion to some degree, and, and well, yeah, uh, sure. whether we keep that condition in or not. We could keep it in and perhaps uh, working with yeah, working ask with the staff to work with the applicant and. The, if they find other acceptable solutions, um, we go with that. Yeah, and that I, th mean? I think as we as we work, the one you know, if there's any, I mean, I would like to see if there's a way of, I mean, of depicting it better, but you know, sort of making some proposals for. Okay, that's you, good. you know, that's good feedback. Um, any other questions to the applicant regarding anything else? Um, 
any other item? Okay, and so everything else you're fine with, it's just that, Yes, right? sir. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, open public hearing. Anybody in the audience would like to speak um, regarding this project? Okay, if not, close public hearing. Discussion? Or a motion? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. I'll make a motion to uh, approve 1305 Lillian Street um, based on staff recommendations except that the height of the foundation to be expressed with a different material be worked out between staff and the applicant in a manner approved uh, uh, acceptable to staff. Do you have a second? Second. I'd like to ask staff if uh, I think you understand the intent of the motion. Is that? Um, We're comfortable with it, yes. Thanks okay. for asking. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries with conditions. Next is 1314 Lillian Street. Okay. Uh, this is across the street from the last one. Uh, on the same block, same same basic lot condition. Um, it's flat at front and then slopes up at the back. Um, and of course, it uh, uh, wasn't developed uh, or a same history of development as, as the other side of the street. It does, however, have a non-contributing house on it that was built in the 1950s. Um, that would be demolished and replaced with a new house. The demolition of the non-contributing structure meets the design guidelines. The new house will be one and a half stories tall. The rough dimensions of this house are 29 feet with a two feet uh, approximate exposed foundation, 28 feet wide. Uh, it's similar in form and proportion to a side gable bungalow, which is a, uh, a common historic form in the neighborhood. Um, staff finds a height and scale of this uh, application to meet design guidelines 2B1 and 2. The front setback is approximately 15 feet and the house will be shifted to the left, which is to the top of that side, to allow a driveway along the right side of the house. Uh, although there is an alley behind the property, it's not really accessible because the grade is so steep at the back. So staff finds that the location and the orientation to be appropriate given the mixed historic context and the topography of the lot. Uh, this setback um, is actually, with the front setback with the non-contributing houses on either side, we sort of looked more a little bit further up the street to some recently approved, and the front setback is consistent with those. Uh, the materials are those that have been all been approved on previous applications throughout the neighborhood. Uh, cement fiber siding, composite shingle roof, split face block foundation. Uh, staff does ask to have final approval of the window and door selections. And we also ask that the uh, HVAC unit, which wasn't indicated on the site plan, that it be located either at the rear or on the side elevation behind the midpoint of the structure. Um, the roof form is a 8 and 12 side-oriented gable with a gabled front dormer. Uh, that's appropriate, common for houses in the area. The windows are generally, generally appropriate in proportion and rhythm. Those meet the design guidelines as well. Uh, in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application to demolish a non-contributing building and to construct a new one-and-a-half-story house at 1314 Lillian Street. With the conditions that staff approve the selection of specific windows and door materials, uh, the location of the exterior HVAC unit, um, and with those staff finds the proposal will meet the design guidelines for the district. Thanks, Sean. Questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward again regarding the project? Um, I'm here to answer any questions, but I agree with the staff recommendation, so. Any questions, applicant? Okay, thanks.
minutes. Uh, open public hearing. Anyone like to speak on regarding this project? Okay, close public hearing. Do I have a discussion or a motion? I make a motion to approve 1314 Lillian Street per recommendations of the staff. I Sorry. second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Next is 1721 Fifth Avenue North. Seventeen twenty one Fifth Avenue North is an application to construct an infill development which will be a duplex on a vacant lot in Salem Town. The proposed infill will be centered on the lot and will meet all base zoning setbacks. At the front, the structure will be seven feet from each of the side property lines, although further back, the width of the structure expands so it is five feet from the side property lines. Staff finds that the width meets the neighborhood context. The front of the structure will be set 20 feet from the front property line, which will be similar to the setback for the structure next door at 1819 Fifth Avenue North. The house will have a footprint of approximately 2,760 square feet. Um, please note that on the site plan, they show a future garage. That garage is not part of this current application. The duplex will be one and a half stories and will have a symmetrical front facade with two identical entrances, one to each unit. The infill will face Fifth Avenue North and will have a full width front porch that is eight feet deep. The house will have an eave height of approximately 11 feet and a ridge height of approximately 30 feet from grade when seen from the front. Staff finds this to meet the historic context where the houses have heights that range from 16 feet to 32 feet. Here are the two side facades. The house's primary roof form will be a side gable. The front slope of the gable will have an 812 pitch, while the back portion will have a 412 pitch. The front gable dormers are set back from the front wall of the house by two feet, which is appropriate. The primary cladding for the structure will be fiber cement siding with a five inch reveal. The main roof will be asphalt shingle, while the porch roof will be standing seam metal. Staff has to approve the shingle and the metal color. The trim will be wood or cement fiberboard. On each of the side facades, full height bays will be clad in board and batten, providing a modern accent. The board and batten material was not specified and staff asked to review it before purchase and installation. The materials for the foundation, the porch columns, porch floor, windows and doors were not specified and staff also asked to approve these materials. Here is the rear facade. And here are some perspective drawings of the structure. The primary windows on the infill are twice as tall as they are wide, thereby meeting the historic proportion of window openings. Staff asked that the condition of approval be that all double and triple window openings have a four to six inch mullion in between them. There are no large expanses of, of wall space without a door or window opening. Um, actually, I think these perspectives don't reflect um, a change that the applicant made. Actually. I believe that these drawings may be slightly older than the ones in your packets. Um, show a window um, behind the front facade, just behind the front porch. I'm sorry about that mistake. Um, and so in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the duplex infill with the following conditions. Staff review and approve the materials for the porch columns, porch floor, foundation, and side bay accents. Staff review and approve all window and door selections prior to purchase and installation. Staff review and approve the um, roof colors and all double and triple window openings have a four to six inch mullion in between them. And HVAC units be placed at the rear or on the side facade beyond the midpoint of the house. Um, so with these conditions, staff recommends approval of the project. Thanks, Melissa. Any questions? Melissa, yes. um, I thought typically you guys like to see duplexes with different looks to each side. Am I mistaken there? Um, typically, we, one of the main things about duplexes is we want the main, them to be under the main form of the roof. So we felt that this met um, typical uh, duplexes that you see. Um, there aren't really that many historic duplexes in, in Salem Town, but kind of in other districts where um, there are two side and there are two entrances. They're kind of equal in terms of hierarchy, if you want to use that word. Um, to the two separate units, but they're still under the same roof form. So we felt that that was similar to other historic duplexes that you see. You have a question? I do. Okay. Um, on the, on the plan, uh, 
uh, toward the front. There's an additional window. We'll go back one more slide. Here, they've added a window. On on our plans, there's a window. And right. So Unfortunately, we have the older drawings in on the PowerPoint. We are proposing that. So, so what's window. what's in okay. your packet is the is the correct drawings that you'll be voting on right okay. now. So, right. so okay. these just um, those reflect some changes that we asked the applicant Thank to you. make. So, and they agreed to this. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Would the applicant like to speak regarding this project? Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, open public hearing. Anyone like to speak uh, also regarding this project? Okay, close public hearing. Discussion? Post um, construction at 1721 Fifth Avenue North, uh, adopting staff recommendation. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, one thing I did want to make note on the last one that Commissioner Champion has um, this note has a, um, left. <laughs> left. <Yeah. laughs> um, next is 2805 Blakemore Avenue. 2805 Blakemore is an application to demolish an existing structure and to construct infill and an outbuilding. The ex existing structure at 2805 Blakemore is a one-story brick house constructed sometime between 1944 and 1951. The house's form, materials, and details do not contribute to the historic character of the district. The house is listed as non-contributing in the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation, or I'm sorry, in the National Register Report for Hillsborough West End, and staff finds that its demolition meets Section 3B2 B of the design guidelines. Here is the site plan for the infill and for the garage. The new infill and the new garage will meet all base zoning setbacks. The infill will be shifted to the left side of the lot to allow for a driveway, which is existing. The front setback will match the setbacks of the two neighboring structures. The house will be 40 feet wide at the front with a maximum width of 42 feet 3 inches. This matches the historic context where houses are between 38 and 52 feet wide. The infill's footprint will be approximately 2,785 square feet. Here are the front and the rear facades. The proposed infill will have a one and a half story form, which is typical of this part of the Hillsborough West End neighborhood. It will have an eave height of approximately 13 feet and a ridge height of 26 feet 10 inches from grade. The primary roof form is a side gable with an 11-12 pitch. The front porch has a gable with a 7-12 pitch. The central front dormer also has a 7-12 gabled roof form. The right slope of the gable merges with the right slope of the front porch. While this is not uh, a, a typical feature in the district. Um, staff finds that the combined dormer and roof, um, porch roof form meets the design guidelines. Here are the two side facades. The primary material for the infill will be brick veneer and the foundation will be split face concrete block. Five inch cement fiberboard siding and, st or, and stucco or cement fiberboard panels will be used as accent materials. The front porch floor will be a concrete slab. The windows will be wood. The roof will be architectural composite singles, shingles. The trim will be wood or cement fiberboard. The rear porch will be screened and staff finds that these known materials all meet the design guidelines and have been approved by the commission in the past. The window proportion and rhythm of openings also meets the design guidelines. Uh, so here is the garage. Uh, the the one-story garage will be 22 feet by 26 feet or 572 square feet. The garage meets all base zoning setbacks and will have garage doors that face the interior of the lot. The garage will be accessed via an existing driveway which will be extended to the rear of the property. The garage will have an eave height of 8 feet and a ridge height of 15 feet, which is appropriate. The roof will be gabled with a slope of approximately 712. And just here are some context photos. Um, these are primarily across the street from, from the site in question. And um, the picture on the top is across the street when the two other photos are on the same side of the street as the house in question. So in summary, staff recommends approval with the condition that staff provide final review of windows, doors, brick, location of HVAC, and the roof color. Any questions for Melissa? On the square windows in the back, is that something you guys are comfortable with? Uh, yeah, because it's in the it's towards the back of the structure. If that was towards the front, towards the front porch, we would ask for a larger opening, but generally staff is more flexible on window opening sizes and proportions towards the back of the structure because it's less visible. 
Thanks, Melissa. Would the applicant like to come forward and say anything regarding the project? I'm here to agree with recommendations. Um, any questions to the applicant? Before? Okay. All right. Uh, open public hearing. Anyone like to speak regarding this project? Close public hearing. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve 2805 Blakemore Avenue per recommendation by the staff. I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. The next is 1831 Fourth Avenue North. 1831 4th Avenue North is an application to construct infill on a vacant lot in Salem Town. The proposed infill will be centered on the lot and will meet all base zoning requirements for setbacks. The structure will be five feet from each of the side property lines, thereby abutting the setback lines. In many cases, it is not appropriate for new infill to abut both side setback lines because that results in a um, structure that's wider than typical structures in the district. However, in this case, staff finds it appropriate because the infill's width of 25 feet matches the historic context and the structure is only one and a half stories tall. The infill will be placed approximately 11 feet, six inches from the front property line, which matches the front setback of the neighboring property at 1833 Fourth Avenue North. The infill will be 20 feet, five, 25 feet wide and approximately 54 feet deep. By comparison, houses that are on narrow lots like this one range in width from 20 to 30 feet. The house's footprint will be approximately 1,350 square feet. Here are the front and the rear facades. The infill will be oriented to face 4th Avenue North. It will have a slightly off-centered entrance behind a partial width front porch. The infill will have a gabled L form. The front gable bay will have a 12-12 slope, while the side gable will have a slope of 7.5-12. The infill will have a foundation height of no more than 2 feet at the front, an eave height of 12 feet, and a ridge height of 28 feet. This matches the historic context, where structures range in height from approximately 16 feet to 31 feet. The primary cladding material for the infill will be five inch cement fiberboard lap siding. Fiber cement board and batten is proposed as accent material in the gable field and the dormer. Decorative back brackets and porch columns will be wood and the trim will be wood or cement fiberboard. The foundation will be split face concrete block and the roof will be architectural shingles. Staff has to approve the roof color. The porch floor will be wood. The materials for the windows and doors are not specified and staff has to approve these. Uh, here are some context photos. These are all on the um, same side of the lot. You kind of, this, the lot in question is the center photo on the bottom, and then the two on the top are on either side of it. Um, here are just some more photographs of that block. In summary, staff recommends approval of the project with the condition that staff review the roof color and the window and door specifications prior to purchase and installation. I don't believe the applicant is here. Okay, thank you. Any questions from Melissa? All right, thanks, Melissa. Uh, open public hearing. <laughs> okay, close public hearing. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve based on staff recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the next is 1616 Forest Avenue. Do you want the, the whole thing or just the fast version? Fast version. All right. <laughs> 1616 Forest Avenue, there is a non-contributing house there. The applicant would like to tear down that house and replace it with a new one. Um, Demolition meets the design guidelines. The new house is very similar in all of its proportions and a character to a historic bungalow, which is a very common historic house in the neighborhood. Um, staff has reviewed the heights, which are all specified in your staff recommendations, finds that they meet the design guidelines, as are the materials, fairly um, uh, commonly approved materials for infill cement siding. Uh, fiberglass, roof shingles, etc. Roof form, um, window 
patterns, uh, et cetera, all meet the design guidelines. Uh, there's a garage going to be at the rear of the lot, accessed by the alley. Uh, that uh, will match in materials. Actually, I think I have another slide coming up at the end of that. Uh, window proportion and rhythm is compatible. There's the garage. It's a two-car, one-story garage. Um, this applicant, I think it was the same applicant, built a very similar house with very almost identical set of plans, slightly different window patterns uh, over on Fatherland Street. Uh, so this is, and it's been constructed earlier this year, so that's actually a really good indication or illustration of, uh, of what the proposed new structure is going to look like. This is on Fatherland Street, uh, but the new application is on Forest Street, but the context is very similar. The conclusion is that staff recommends approval of the application to demolish the non-contributing building and to construct a new one and a half story house at 1616 Forest Avenue with the conditions that staff approve the selection of specific window and doors. Um, also that staff approves the material of the porch floor and columns and railings if they're necessary uh, and the location of exterior HVAC units. Um, other than that, staff finds the application would meet the design guidelines for new construction in the Lachlan Springs East End overlay. Thanks, Sean. Quick question. Do you see the, the 6 by 12 pitch roofs on the back? Is that something you we see much? I don't really remember seeing. Um, like the Melissa was saying with the leeway given to windows, um, it's uh, the visibility is less, and, and that portion sets in from the sides. So because it's at the back and it sets in, even though it's new construction, um, it's still something that actually is pretty typical of what you would see for a historic bungalow. So it seemed all right. I got a question. So the new building will be approximately in the same vicinity in terms of frontage? Yes. Uh, I skipped over the site plan there. Sorry about that. Um, yes, the front setback will align with the adjacent structures, which I believe are both historic. They'll align with them, but so it will not be the same frontage as the existing house. Um, I really didn't look too much that the existing building being non-contributing, other than meeting the demolition for design guidelines, I didn't get too okay. much into reviewing its condition. Its age is um, pretty recent compared to the, the rest of the area. All right. Thanks, Sean. Um, would the applicant like to say anything regarding the project? Happy to answer your question. Okay. Any questions to the applicant? All right. Um, I guess no sense to open public hearing. So do I have a motion or a discussion? I have a motion. OK, with respect to 1616 Forest Avenue, I move to approve per staff rec recommendations and subject to staff conditions. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? OK. Motion carries. Um, that concludes our business. I would like to welcome Paul Hoffman to the Metro Historical Zoning, Metro Historical Commission. Thank you very much for joining us and um, look forward to working with you more in the future. And of course, you too, Sean. <laughs> All right, any other business staff? Okay, meeting adjourned.